So welcome to the, this is the freedom from religion. I called it that, that's the topic, because really, when you look at things, that's the big downfall. And especially when you look in the United States, there are a lot of people who go to churches and claim to be Christian, but what they're doing, they're not really following what the scripture says, or they're not, especially not following it rightly divided, they're really following what their religion says. And you know, a lot of times people will say, well, what, what's the big deal? You know, they're good moral people, they're going to church, they, they believe the gospel, they're safe, but uh, what we're gonna find out when it comes to scripture is that it is a very big deal to God. It's because of religion that Satan was kicked out of the heavenly places, and it's because of religion that man gave up, that man sinned. And uh, we're gonna look at that first. The first topic here is that God hates religion, and the reason is because religion hates God. Um, I looked up a definition in the dictionary. It's just a modern dictionary definition of the word religion. And it says, uh, a set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe, especially when considered as the creation of a superhuman agency or agencies, usually involving devotional and ritual observances, and often containing a moral code governing the conduct of human affairs. A uh, very general there that could apply to pretty much anything. Uh, second definition is a specific fundamental set of beliefs and practices generally agreed upon by a number of persons or sects. And I think that's, that second definition is the problem that we have in, in Christianity because it says a specific fundamental set of beliefs and practices generally agreed upon by a number of persons or sects. It's not what does the Bible say, what does God say. Religion is all about what do we as man come up with. And, but when you look at religion in the Bible, if you go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, you'll see that God's definition of religion is quite a bit different than that. And he really, you know, that, of course that's just a basic definition there um, to make everybody feel good, but God just really tells you what religion is all about just in this one verse. So rather than looking at the dictionary, we should look at, you know, what does God say religion is? Uh, if you look in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, he is immediately telling you from 2 Corinthians 10, 3, that it's a reference to the flesh. The religion is involved in the flesh. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So right away, the context here is the flesh. And then he says in verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And then here's the definition that I wrote on your outline. Religion is, uh, it says, casting down, and religion is imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And, of course, what we should do instead is to bring it into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Uh, so right there, that's what I put as the definition of religion, is imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. So when the world looks at it and says, well, they're very religious, they're Christians, they think that you're actually closer to God by believing what you believe. Uh, God says that religion is the opposite. It's an imagination and high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. It's uh, directly opposed to God. It's saying, I'm not going to believe what God says in his word. I'm not going to follow that. Instead, I'm going to come up with a set of beliefs. And it's according to, as verse 3 says, you know, warring after the flesh. It's not a spiritual, it's not allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you into what God would have for you today. Rather, it's looking at what the flesh says, what the flesh wants. It's feeding the flesh, um, those imaginations and high things. And if you go over to Isaiah chapter 14, we'll see that and your first fill in the blank there is that Satan is the father of religion. It, it really all started with him. He was the, as Ezekiel 28 says he was the anointed cherub that covers the throne. He was put in that position of a worship leader in heaven. Uh, it says he was perfect in all his ways. And it says until iniquity was found in him. And the iniquity that was found in him, it mentions in Isaiah 14 what it was. It's all these I will statements. Verse 12 there, Isaiah 14, 12. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, this is the religion, this is, 
These are imaginations and high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. He says, verse 13, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Religion exalts itself against the knowledge of God, saying that I'm going to be like God. And so he is the father of religion. He was the first to exalt himself against God. And what he did when he got man to rebel in Adam, with Adam and Eve is he got them to do the same thing over in Genesis 3 when they had the, he got them to eat that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan told Eve, well, if you eat that, God doesn't want you to eat it because he's trying to keep something good from you. He knows you'll be like God. That's what Satan said. He says, I will be like the Most High, like God. He gets Adam and Eve to follow the same thing. And it's really God, if you, if you look at, you know, if you look at the plan and you understand Paul's epistles and the plan that God has for us, we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We are already seated together with Him there. Um, in, in a way, I mean, we're not God, I'm not saying that, but in a way you can say we are like God because we've got all those blessings. We're going to be with Him forever in, in eternal places there in heaven. So God has a plan to exalt us. He doesn't want us staying in the depravity of sin and following our sin nature. God sent, of course, sent His Son to die for us and that through His blood we are redeemed and through, through Christ then we have these blessings in heavenly places. So He's given us all those things freely. So we don't have to use religion to try to get it ourselves, but yet that's what man does. Man says, I, I've got to do it myself. It's the pride of man. Satan in his pride says, I'm going to be like the most high God. And so he decides, I'm going to do it myself. God already had a plan. Um, you know, it was today's plan, of course, was a mystery until revealed to the Apostle Paul. But that plan was in place before the foundation of the world. He already had that plan to make man sort of like him and that they would be blessed and they would have eternal life in him. They already had that, God already had that plan for us, but yet Satan's, and of course Satan, he was already in a position as worship leader, as the anointed cherub that covereth, to be in eternal places forever with, with God. He already had blessings, but yet he says, I'm going to do it myself. And that's what religion does. Religion says, I'm going to do it myself. And we see that, I wrote on your outline that Satan, he got Adam and Eve to sin. And, he, and today, that's just continued 6,000 years ago all the way to now. And it will continue until Satan is thrown in the lake of fire. It says, he gets Christians to tell his lies through religion so that man will not have faith in God. And the reason is because it is impossible to please God without faith. That's what Hebrews 11:6 6 says. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. So God has this plan. He wants, us, he wants to give us eternal blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Um, of course, with Israel, the same thing, eternal life in the earthly kingdom, uh, but still blessed with God, being with Him forever. He has that plan, and God says, here, and the plan is executed by faith. Regardless of what dispensation you're in, um, you just have to have faith in whatever God tells you. Whatever the gospel is for that dispensation, you have faith in it, you believe that. Uh, you will have, you'll receive that eternal life. What Satan does is he comes along and he says, he's going the complete opposite of God's plan. He says, instead of trusting in God to do all the work through the finished work of Christ and through everything that he's done, through the Holy Spirit working in you, through God the Father and the whole Godhead working in action, instead of doing that, God says, or Satan says, we're going to abandon that plan instead of having faith in what God's already done for you. Let's do our own thing because there's a lot more pride in it. It's a lot more enjoyment if I do it myself because now I can say, look at what I did. Look at how I made myself to be like God. That's what Satan says he was going to do. That's how he tempted Adam and Eve. And that's why if we go over to John chapter 8, we'll see that it's in the context of religion that um, Satan is mentioned here in John chapter 8. Um, Really, the, the whole passage, he, he's talking, of course, and he's talking to the Pharisees, at least in the last uh, good majority of this chapter here in John chapter 8. 
And he's talking to, these are religious people. In Mark chapter 7, he, he talks about the Pharisees and he says, you've rejected the commandments of God for the commandments of men and the Jewish traditions. You're following traditions and, and commandments of men. In other words, you're following religion instead of following what God has said. And so he's in this argument with them. Uh, you know, keep in mind that these people here, these Pharisees, they're not people who are, we would think of as bad people. You know, they weren't out, they, they weren't the ones who were thrown in jail for killing somebody or, or going and stealing things. You know, they weren't people who we would consider criminals. They were the people of their day in the, in the Jewish community that the Jews would look up to. They're the ones in the temple. They're the rabbis. They wear the, the long robes and everything, and they look like they're very godly. They're, they're uh, to use the word for today, you'd say they're Christians, um, but they had this religious thing about it. And then, but what he says is he doesn't say that. He doesn't, that he gives the greatest condemnation to this religious people that he does for the others. Uh, he's, and he's talking to them, you know, and here they are, uh, down in verse 39, John 8, 39. Here they are, they said, they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. So they're claiming that, you know, we're, um, we're saved. We're going to have eternal life in the kingdom because we belong to Abraham. We're Jews. But Jesus doesn't say that. He, you know, they're the people that the Jews would look up to as these religious people. But yet Jesus saith unto them, if you were Abraham's children... You would do the works of Abraham. So he's showing, okay, physically you're a Jew, but that doesn't mean you're going to be in the kingdom. It's, it's a question of faith. And these people are basing themselves on religion instead. And so his final indictment of them, in verse 44, he plainly tells them, he says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. And now he tells you what the devil is all about. He says he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. So you may think, well, that's interesting. He was a murderer from the beginning. Well, you know, Satan didn't come with a AK-47. He didn't come with a sword. He didn't come and physically kill Adam and Eve. But yet he did kill them spiritually. It was that God had said, if you eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he says, in the day that ye shall eat of it, ye shall surely die. He says, in that day. We know from Titus chapter 1 verse 2 that God cannot lie. So God says, in the day that you eat of that fruit, you're going to die. But yet, Adam, according to the genealogy in Genesis chapter 5, lives another 900 years or, or more. Um, he didn't. You don't see him actually struck dead that day, but yet God said he would. So what he's talking about there, he didn't die physically. He continued to live physically. But the death there, when he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, was a spiritual death. He was in an innocent state. He was in fellowship with God. God came in the cool of the, of the day and walked with him. And yet he ended up, when he took of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he died spiritually that day uh, because God said he would. And so... That really is why Satan is called there a murderer from the beginning. Can we say amen? Yeah. <laughs> and you could, if you're filling the blank there, is that since it is impossible to please God without faith, this makes Satan a mass murderer. Since he's the one, he creates this religious system, and he says, you don't need God's plan, forget that, you know. Trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ, that you don't get to do anything. In fact, most churches, even if they teach a gospel message of believing in the blood of Christ as atonement for your sins, they're still going to throw some kind of works in it. They'll say, well, if you don't have works that go along with the faith, then you never had the true faith to be saved. Or you know, they'll throw in other religious things or maybe some requirements. You have to tithe or you have to become a member of the church in order to be in good standing with God. They throw in these religious things. It's not just the blood of Christ. It's not faith alone. But yet, and so that's what, that's what Satan did with the promise that God made to Adam and Eve. They could have lived forever in that, in that Garden of Eden if they did not take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan twists it around and says, well, God just doesn't want you to be like him. He brings about a lie. And in so doing, and Adam and Eve following it, they were killed that day. He was a murderer. And so Satan 
is a mass murderer with his religious program. That's how serious God takes this stuff. Um, if you go back to John chapter 3, yeah, it's interesting that, especially, you'll get this, and I've gotten this on YouTube, people who will make comments and they'll say, um, you know, that Jesus came, that the God of the Old Testament was this vengeful God, and he hated people, he'd strike people dead. But Jesus was this loving, caring God, you know, the different persona of God, and this is the one we follow. And, and John 3, and of course verse 16, everybody's familiar with that passage, and it says in verse 17, the reason that God gave His only begotten Son, it says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. So yes, He is a loving, caring God. He came in order to save people. But what we just read is, He says He came into the world not to condemn the world. He wanted to save it. But yet He's over here calling the Pharisees children of the devil. Uh, you know, condemning them in that, in that respect. So, so it shows that even, God, even though God's Jesus coming, his purpose was to save the world, which he ultimately did through his death on the cross, that he still, it shows that even if that was his purpose, he still came and ended up condemning uh, these religious folks because he saw that really people who were following them, they would end up following a, you know, the mass murderer Satan. They'd end up having their souls killed if they did not follow what God's word said to them rather than, uh, and they follow religion instead. Um, I got down here, if we go over to Genesis chapter 4. So Satan, he was the father, father of religion. He got Adam and Eve to sin. And he's just been a murderer since then. Whoever decides, I'm not going to have faith in God's plan, but I'm going to do it myself in the pride of man in the flesh. And I'm going to follow what Satan has ultimately. Then, then they will end up losing their souls in the lake of fire. And we see a demonstration of this physically uh, what religion does uh, with the story of Cain and Abel um, and that's really the first uh, you see religion with Satan you see it also with Adam and Eve taking of the fig leaves to cover themselves providing a covering that God did not provide for themselves that was religion but you see it here in Cain and Abel as well in Genesis chapter 4 uh, it says in verse 3 in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. So you see what Cain did here, he didn't do anything that we would consider bad. He wasn't out there, you know, killing people. He wasn't committing adultery. He wasn't doing all these bad things that we'd associate with people we need to lock up and stay out of society. He wasn't doing those things. He was just bringing an offering unto the Lord. And he, he, um, he was someone who raised, uh, he was a tiller of the ground, so he had fruit. So he thought what ended up happening with the background is that God required an animal sacrifice here. And so he would, both, both Cain and Abel were supposed to bring this animal sacrifice in order to be uh, accepted by God. And yet Cain thinks in the way religion thinks. Again, God has a plan. He says animal sacrifice as a covering for your sin, as a sign of you know what will happen later. And he's got that plan. Cain says, well, I don't like that plan. I'm gonna do my own thing. And instead of following what God said and bringing the sacrifice, the animal sacrifice, he brings fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Again, it seems like something good. He's appearing to the Lord. He's bringing an offering unto the Lord. It seems like a good thing. Um, but yet, it's something that he came up in his mind. It's a religious thing. And that is why the Lord had respect unto Abel, but not unto Cain. Uh, and so the result, of course, later on the chapter, is that Cain ends up killing Abel. Uh, so you have your first physical murder. You had the first spiritual murder with Satan getting Adam and Eve to take up the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now you have the first physical murder recorded in scripture here and it's all over religion. So uh, you're filling the blank there is the first man to kill someone was Cain and he did it because of religion. He did it because of religion. Um, he thought God had a plan. God told them what they were to bring and instead Cain says, I don't like that plan because it's not something I came up with. It's a pride thing. And so he says, I've got a different plan and I'm gonna do it. I mean, even as a guy, I see that in my, 
in my married life, I'll end up, my wife will suggest something. And, and I will, I'll say, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, then 10 minutes later, yeah, yeah, I, I ended up doing it. Uh, but it's, but I did, the reason I rejected it is first is because it wasn't my idea because she's the one that came up with it. So why am I going to follow that? So I'm going to follow my idea. It's still the same idea, but it was my idea. It wasn't hers, so it's a prideful thing. The women aren't allowed to say amen, are they? <laughs> well, they, we, we all know it's true. It's, it's, usually, it's usually two days later, he goes, I have an idea. I should be going, that's the same one I gave you. <laughs> that's the same one I gave you. That's the same one I yeah, women, well, women are to keep silence in church. Mary, you're not allowed to talk about that. <laughs> and, and so, so you see that just in our lives. So it's it's the same. Really, that's what religion is is about. God has a plan to give us eternal life in Him, and here we are. We know the plan, but out of pride, we think, "Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna come up with my own plan." It's still in your mind. It's still the same result. You ask people about how are you, you know, if, if you were to die today, you appear before God, and He says, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Most people would say, well, I've lived a pretty good moral life. I tried to obey the Ten Commandments, and they'll say things like that. They won't say, by the grace of God, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, everybody wants to have eternal life and have these great things for, for all eternity, but most people will not go along with God's plan because... That wasn't my idea. And not only was it not my idea, but I don't have to do anything for it. I don't have to go to church. I don't even have to pray. I don't have to do good works. All I have to do is believe. That's, that's nothing. So I, I don't like that because I don't get any glory out of that. So I'm going to do my own prideful thing. And uh, that's what Cain did here. And because God's, it goes against God's plan of by faith, and it's all by the blood of Christ, uh, then God does not accept I put down there, God does not accept sacrifices offered in His name. Um, because in this case, if you go over to Amos chapter 5, we're going to see an example of the religion here. Um, Amos, one of those small minor prophets. If you find Ezekiel, then it's Daniel, Hosea, Joel, and then Amos. Uh, there are a lot of examples that we can find, especially in the Old Testament. God's already laid out a plan. He's given it. He says, here are the commandments to follow. Here are the rules. He's got certain sacrifices that they're supposed to bring on Sabbath days, new moons, different feasts. Uh, he's got all these requirements under the law. And basically, he's saying, okay, Israel, here's, here's what I require. Go do it. And here we see in Amos chapter 5 that this is, of course, later on in Israel's history, that they are doing the things that God required. But the thing is, they're doing it out of religion. They're not doing it out of faith, saying, okay, I realize my sin, and I'm going to trust in God's plan here, the law. I'm not, obviously, I'm not obeying the law perfectly. I'm going to bring the animal sacrifices that He says under the law. I'm going to do those things under the law in faith that God will redeem me out of that and give me eternal life. That God will redeem me out of my sinful condition. And so that's why I'm bringing this sacrifice. If they did that, God would have been pleased because it would have been out of faith. But what they did was they just did their, that they brought the sacrifices, but it wasn't out of faith. It was just a ritual observance. And they built religion, basically. They built their own system. And you see here in Amos chapter 5, verse 21, he says, Amos 5, verse 21, God speaks to Israel. He says, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Well, over in Leviticus 23, he says, These are, thus saith the Lord, these are the feasts of the Lord. And he gives the certain feasts, he had the spring feast, the fall feast, and he gives when they're to celebrate and everything. God is the one who came up with these feasts. He came up with the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He told them to go through that. And, but yet, in this verse here, he doesn't say, I hate, I despise my feast days, the feast of the Lord. I will not smell in my solemn assemblies. He doesn't say that. He says, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Even though God was the one who prescribed these things, 
because they didn't do it in faith that God would redeem them somehow through that law of covenant there and give them eternal life in the kingdom because they didn't do that. They did it out of religion and they made a ritual thing out of it. And they, I look holier than the other person if I go in with, you know, the Pharisees, they'd wear their boxes and they'd put them on their forehead and on their arms and they'd wear the long robes with the fringes and everything and they look good to everybody. Jesus said for a pretense they make prayers that when they fast they would put they would put ashen faces and make it look like they were really doing these great things for God. Instead of just doing it out of heart of faith, they were doing it for religion's sake to look pride, to look good to man. And so God says, I hate that. I despise it. And even though you're doing the feast days and the solemn assemblies, I'm not going to accept it. Verse 22, though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. But let judgment run down as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? And now he gets to the heart of it. When they're offering these things, they are offering out of faith to God. They are offering it out of a religious worship. And he says, as far as he's concerned, even though they carried a physical tabernacle around the wilderness, God gave several chapters in Exodus where they were to build this tabernacle and they were to carry it around with them and God would indwell the tabernacle and meet with them there. Um, they carried it around. They built it as God had prescribed, but because they were doing it in the name of religion, in verse 26 here, he doesn't say, it's my tabernacle. He says, but ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Chian, your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. So you've got here, in other words, even if you do what's prescribed by God, if you do it out of a prideful thing, out of trying to look good to men, and you're trying to work your way to heaven and you make your own righteousness, then God does not accept it. This is how, even though they're doing what God had prescribed because they're doing it out of the wrong attitude, God will not accept it. He says, you're not carrying around my tabernacle in the temple, even though that's physically what you carried around. Spiritually, you're carrying around a tabernacle to Moloch and to these other gods because you're worshiping them. You, your heart attitude is of the flesh, it's of religion. Um, so you're fill in the blank there is that God does not recognize their feasts, Sabbaths, and sacrifices, even though God is the one who prescribed them. God does not recognize.